Thank you. As I was saying, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, some of this lecture may be preaching to the choir, as I'm sure anybody that works with or owns rabbits has heard something about this horrible rabbit pandemic we've been living with. But what I wanted to do today was do a, a brief review of rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus two. So the agenda today, basically we're gonna discuss the virus in and of itself. We'll talk a bit about how it spreads, some of the epidemiology around this disease as it's making its way from state to state across the United States. Some of the information about vaccinations, biosecurity and the requirements to keep your rabbits safe. And then we'll conclude with some information on protecting your rabbits, some information for people who show, and then a little bit of information for people who work in wildlife rehabilitation. And then we'll leave some time to do some questions and some comments. Um, it's not limited to questions as well, if anybody has comments. And one thing I always say is if anybody has corrections, please let me know. This is an ever evolving topic. From the time that I was invited to give this lecture to today, I've had to edit the lecture multiple times based on new developments, new reports, um, and new states where it's been found, and even one state where it was found, and then that was rejected. So um, if there's any corrections or any newer information, by all means, feel free to put those in the comments section as well in the chat. So what is RHDV2? Well, it's a very contagious and fatal Khaleesi virus. It's a single-stranded RNA virus that has now spread into the wild populations in the United States and is wreaking havoc throughout the United States. No strains are a threat to human health. I think that's one important thing to remember. It's, it's sadly just a virus that's affecting our rabbit populations but doesn't pose any risk to other animals or to humans. RHDV2, as the two implies, is a new strain, not to be confused with previous RHDV, DVA, or one, which were two previous genotypes of the disease where RHDV2 is believed to be a mutation of one of those. Again, it only affects rabbits, the concern with RHDV2 is how strongly it can affect wild rabbit populations. Since 2020, approximately, the die-offs that have been seen in wild populations in North America have been identified, reported to state veterinarians, and are part of our understanding of how the disease is spreading. It's also important to note that previous to the development of vaccines specific for RHDV2, the vaccines that protected against RHDV or RHDV1 will not protect rabbits against the new variant. The USDA has classified this as a foreign animal disease. So even though we have reports and animals dying from it, it's still considered to be a foreign animal disease, which means it's a high concern at both state and federal levels. RHDV2, the variant we're discussing today, has been detected throughout Europe, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and spreading through the Americas. And all RHDVs are reportable to the World Organization for Animal Health. These are organizations that are working to police the spread of diseases in attempts to try to contain them and in attempts to try to make sure we monitor and perform enough disease surveillance. Most importantly, this virus is a sudden killer that a lot of times gives very little warning. Rabbits can die without showing any symptoms at all. And many people think because it's called rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, indicating that it causes hemorrhage or bleeding, that that's one of the key features. But it's important to know that even though that is an end result of infection, not all rabbits will show bleeding on the outside. So we wanna make sure we're not just looking for um, blood on the outside of the bunny to dismiss the possibility that it could have died from RHDV2. So remember, any sudden death is suspicious if you're in an endemic state or in an area where it's been reported or wild rabbits in your area are dying from it. Remember that it should be reported to your state or local veterinarian to make sure that rabbits are tested and make sure that we continue to track the disease. 
A quick timeline summary, basically, the disease first emerged in France in 2010, and it quickly spread through the rabbit populations, replacing RHDV1, which was in itself causing enough problems for the rabbit populations throughout Europe. There was an occurrence in Quebec, Canada in 2016, but it was thought to be a different strain of RHDV2, of which the source of the introduction into Quebec was unknown. Then in 2018, it was found in some feral rabbits in British Columbia, but that was found to be an isolate from a rabbit farm that was in the Azores Islands off the coast of Portugal, identified back in 2011. So it's starting to show where disease can spread. It was later detected in 2018 in Ohio, and that was found to match the strain that was first identified in Canada. And then in 2019 in Vancouver, numerous cases were identified. And then from July to December, it was confirmed in Washington state and the San Juan Islands off Washington state, which was a genetically similar to the 2018 Canada strain as well. So we're starting to see a little bit of how disease can move through populations. In March, 2020, an unusual isolated event it was identified in 11 rabbits in a New York City veterinary hospital. These were rabbits that were currently hospitalized that became suddenly ill and died very quickly. It doesn't appear it's ever been reported in New York. It was an isolated closed event. The hospital took precautions to make sure that it wouldn't spread and it doesn't appear to have been identified since then. Then there started to be additional reports of native wild rabbits and hares dying off throughout the Southwest United States, which is where it started grabbing that media attention and started the snowball effect. So that by March, 2020, a pet rabbit in New Mexico was identified and then further wild and domestic rabbits in multiple states have been identified since then as we continue to monitor the spread of the disease. Basically, we're experiencing a rabbit pandemic during our COVID pandemic as the disease spreads. This is just a, an image from the rhdv2.com website um, showing the spread of the disease starting back in 1984 when RHD was identified in China, millions of rabbits dead from the disease. In the 90s, it had already spread through many countries but we knew that North American wild rabbits were not susceptible to the original RHDV. In 2000, RHDV1, a new strain emerged in Europe. And then in 2010, the RHDV2 strain developed. And as I mentioned in the last slide, from then we've had the cases reported in the United States, we've had the spread through the United States, and then we've seen the outbreaks and that has continued to spread up through and until today. The RHDV2 vaccines were then developed at that time. Previous to that, there were only vaccines for the previous strains and then ongoing from 2020 through today. This map shows the current distribution of confirmed cases. These are basically what the USDA would call the endemic states where the disease has been definitively seen and reported. You'll notice I had to put a cross out through Arkansas. There was some reports recently of a confirmed case, which as I mentioned earlier was retracted. So the Arkansas case was a false positive and that rabbit did not have it. So it has not been found in Arkansas. But the interesting thing looking at a map like this is you can see the distribution. And part of that has to do with when a disease crosses into the wild population, the potential for spread through wild rabbits and hares and how we're seeing sort of this geographic division, but peppering through other places and eventually we'll probably see it move through most of the other states. This is a map from the North Americans RHDB2 Facebook group, which is a very active group of people who are monitoring and following this disease. Um, members have participated in trying to have case reporting put on a map like this. Um, this map is probably about a month old because cases since then have been reported in Idaho and Oregon in March and April, the current time that we're in. So we're seeing that continued spread throughout. So the previous slide showing all the reported states was more accurate. This is simply to illustrate, again, 
where the disease is, is spreading, and you can also appreciate how far the disease has spread down through the Baja Peninsula and into Mexico throughout much of Mexico at this point. So what are the symptoms of RHDV2? Unfortunately, the symptoms can be fairly vague, meaning the symptoms are um, general, loss of appetite, lethargy. Many of these rabbits will present with a high fever. Um, some will show seizures, jaundice or icterus, which is yellowing of the mucous membranes. The most significant may be bleeding, which can be seen from the mouth, nose, or even from the rectum. Difficulty breathing, but most importantly, sudden death. Um, this clip at the bottom is a highlight from an article that was in the New Yorker magazine that basically talked about referring to it as bunny Ebola. It's a, a mysterious disease that wreaks havoc very quickly and causes a rapid death. And again, that's the biggest concern with it. So some of these symptoms are nonspecific, but also important. The image I have there shows a hemorrhagic lungs and you can see blood filling up the trachea there. So it basically shows how the virus will attack the liver leading to clotting disorders that leads to bleeding and this shows an, a clear illustration of, of preceding death, what happens in the body. So some of the epidemiology of this disease, the incubation period is anywhere from three to nine days. So it's fairly rapid. Different levels of infection. So subacute infection is mild. If the rabbit is able to survive the infection and can clear it, they may develop antibodies, which may help them be resistant to future infections. The paracute infection is often the one where they collapse and die, but don't show any other signs or symptoms. The acute infection is the more serious, showing um, nervous and respiratory symptoms, the bleeding, blood in the feces, loss of appetite. Death usually occurs between one and three days. And if these rabbits do have necropsies or autopsies, it almost always reveals hepatic necrosis and hemorrhage, so internal bleeding, basically. There was a retrospective study done in the United Kingdom that reported a summary of the lesions. I put the link at the bottom there, basically showing the distribution of lesions in the animals that died from it that had necropsies done and showed how it can affect multiple organs, including the spleen and the kidneys and the heart resulting in a terminal bleeding to death. The big problem with this disease is the clear links between the outbreaks remains unknown. So the disease kind of shows up, we know it's in the wild populations, but we don't always have a direct clear link of how it may spread. Initially, the case in Arkansas was thought to be traced back to a rabbit that was purchased at a rabbit show and then went home and then went to another rabbit show. And we thought we were establishing these clear links between disease spread, but again, that one turned out not to have it. So those clear links remain unknown and challenging to investigators. So RHDV transmission, how is this virus spread? Unfortunately, by most any way. And that's another difficult part about dealing with this disease. Transmission by nasal or respiratory secretions, saliva, ocular secretions, trauma, blood feeding insects, direct contact with infected animals, either their meat, their fur, or with the rabbit, any fomites they live in, litter boxes, water bowls, your clothes if you touch this rabbit, um, the virus is basically present in almost all secretions and excretions and can also be spread by mechanical vectors. So one of the big ones, of course, has been your own other pets. The, the classic scenario of the person whose dog found a dead rabbit in the backyard, picked it up, brought it over, and then that can create exposure if you're somebody that has pet rabbits in the home. Virus can contaminate food and water. This has come up a lot where people develop concerns about where vegetables were being grown, where they were sourcing their hay, where things were being shipped from states that had the disease. So it, it sort of sent up an alert about the concerns with that issue. Um, and the, the virus can be present in decaying tissue for up to three months. That means a rabbit may die from this and may still be a form of contagion for up to 90 days, possibly even longer. 
So all of these descriptions basically outline what a serious and, and terrible virus this is and how it's able to do what it's doing um, so aggressively. Again, exposure can occur anywhere, in the wild, in a shelter, in a wildlife rehabilitation center, even in veterinary hospitals, and of course, with any rabbit movement, which is why there's been a big push to not have rabbit shows, to, for people to be careful about the movement of rabbits, even if it's moving rabbits to new homes or selling or adoptions. It's just created a lot of issues in trying to do uh, safe practice and trying to make sure we're not unknowingly spreading the disease. The mortality rate is anywhere from five to 80% or more. However, in the 2020 outbreak, when it first started, officials were reporting death rates about 90%. So while we know that some rabbits may survive, the vast majority, even at that outbreak, 90% of the rabbits that were infected died from the disease. And that's a pretty harrowing statistic. Survivors who don't succumb to the disease are considered to be carriers and we know they can shed the virus for at least 42 days. That number may even be longer. But again, another aspect of why viruses in and of themselves are so strong and so capable of all the damage they do is that they are um, persistent and they're able to spread and they tend to be able to sustain themselves for long periods. Asymptomatic carriers, which we believe happen, those rabbits that catch the virus don't really show any symptoms or symptoms may be mild, like a short-term loss of appetite or something like that, can then go on and just shed the virus unbeknownst to anybody that's looking at that rabbit to realize that that rabbit is actually shedding the virus and is transmitting that disease to other rabbits. Diagnostic testing um, is done by the United States Department of Agriculture's Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, their Foreign Animal Disease Laboratory in Plum Island. They are able to test to, for virus antigen and antibodies. The most ideal, sadly, is if a rabbit dies, that they are sent organ biopsies or specimens. The most ideal liver, lung, spleen, and whole blood samples can be sent. The important thing to know is that lab can only accept submissions from state veterinarians. So you and I can't test the rabbit. Your local family vet can't test the rabbit. It has to go through a USDA state veterinarian who can coordinate the collection of samples from a deceased rabbit and get those sent off for testing. Um, it's recommended that in any rabbit that may show compatible clinical signs, any wild rabbits that die near your home, or any exposure to people who have been exposed to rabbits, um, go through your state veterinarian and these are reported. There are currently no other labs that offer testing. I have seen some information come up from some private diagnostic labs claiming that they can test rabbits for this disease. Um, my understanding is those are not valid tests, that those labs should not have the ability to actually test for it, and that it's not recommended to do that. So just because a lab sends a, a letter to a veterinarian saying, hi, our lab can test for RHDV2, start sending us blood samples from your client's pets, it doesn't mean you should do it. Right now, the Foreign Animal Disease Lab is the only validated, accurate, trustworthy lab for diagnosing this disease. So one of the most important aspects with any disease as all of us have lived through COVID for the last year is what type of prevention is there really? What can we do to try to slow down disease spread? What steps can we take to attempt to try to eradicate a disease? Strict biosecurity measures are essential in all of the facilities where a rabbit may be, wildlife, rescue, uh, shelters, private homes, research laboratories, anywhere where the virus could get into the rabbit population. Sanitation and disinfection, maintenance of closed colonies, and quarantine. People often overlook quarantine, even when we're not dealing with a disease like this. Even in other instances, we forget that sometimes any new rabbit that comes into our home, comes into a shelter, comes into any facility, should have some sort of quarantine time 
just to make sure that that animal doesn't break with symptoms of a disease that we'd otherwise be glad we didn't expose other rabbits to. Inactivated RHDV2 vaccines currently registered in Spain and France are used in some of the countries throughout uh, Europe and the United Kingdom. We'll touch a little bit more about this, but these vaccines are not licensed in the United States. And this has been the part of a big controversy about enacting widespread vaccination to protect rabbits. Um, because they're not licensed for use in the United States, it requires special permitting, special permissions, and a heck of a lot of work to try to get these vaccines imported into the United States and approved by our USDA. The state veterinarian must authorize the use of them until each individual state's veterinarian says, yes, you can import them, it is not allowed. Um, it's quite difficult to go through the process of filing paperwork. You're basically trying to apply to use a foreign biological in a country where it's not licensed for use. Um, it requires shipping under certain um, conditions, storage conditions, much like we heard about some of the COVID vaccines. Um, it requires hiring a broker to facilitate the import and the delivery of these vaccines. And then it just requires a lot of steps from there, which we'll also touch on. Just remember all rabbits that receive vaccination must be registered and follow each state's very specific requirements to administer that vaccine. Now, most of the states are having very similar requirements, but there are subtle differences in them and the allowance of it. One of the biggest things that has come up has been people wanting to buy the vaccine themselves and administer it themselves. Um, much like people are used to thinking about livestock vaccines that are available at the farm store um, or other vaccines that even are procurable from your veterinarian that they may be able to allow you to administer. But unfortunately, this one is not allowed. Um, in most states, I can mostly speak for Arizona where I live and work, it has to be administered by a veterinarian. It can't even be administered by a technician when I'm standing next to them. It has to actually be by the veterinarian who puts that vaccine into the rabbit's body. And again, a lot of that red tape is necessary, but it makes for some difficulties. So the vaccination um, would be an annual to protect against RHDV. It's expected to be effective for most rabbits with numbers above 90% protection in some of the studies that have been done. No vaccine is 100% effective in every individual receiving it, but certainly if vaccinated, it may help a rabbit survive when they're exposed, even if they don't have the full immune reaction and have complete immunity. So vaccination is quite important in slowing and, and potentially eradicating this disease. Vaccination along with biosecurity measures, which have to be done even after vaccination. Same thing with COVID where we're starting to vaccinate. So people have become a bit looser. People are willing to stop wearing masks. More, more people are congregating. Everything is opening. We still have to be careful. And remember that biosecurity goes along with vaccination. The immunity occurs about a week after vaccine is administered. That's about the amount of time it takes the rabbit's body to develop those antibodies so that they could potentially fight the disease. RHDV2 is fatal to young rabbits, which is a difference from the RHDV1, which generally didn't affect young or baby rabbits. Um, and the two vaccines that are available, Filivac and Aravac, that are importable to the United States through all the work, um, generally, Filivac requires uh, a booster and Aravac over 30 days old and annually, and then annual boosters for both of them. Um, there's some differences in what they cover, and we'll touch on that in a moment. But if your state veterinarian imports these vaccines, they are going to require every person that allows their pet to receive one to sign a waiver. And part of that is just the red tape paper trail because it's a non-licensed biological being used. So basically every time I administer this vaccine in my hospital, the owner has to sign a waiver saying they understand that it is a foreign biological, that it is not manufactured or licensed for use in the United States, and that we are using it because it's an extenuating circumstance that requires the use of it. And so that's generally a requirement in almost all states, if not all states. 
vaccination concerns. Um, one of the issues that has come up that certain people are sensitive to is both of these vaccines are made in the lab by infecting rabbits with the disease and then harvesting their organs to make vaccines. Unfortunately, that's the sad state of the way a lot of biologicals and a lot of vaccines are made. The reason that it's a little bit more controversial for some people, especially most of us that are in rescue, especially most of us that lead lifestyles where we're trying to protect animals and nature um, and we're sensitive. Um, we always have to distinguish between biomedical research and sort of cosmetic, less necessary type of reasons that we cost animal lives. Um, in this situation, both of these companies are using rabbits. Now there's another vaccine that's available in Europe, the Novavax Mixo RHD plus vaccine which is not produced in live animals. And this is where the source of the controversy comes from because if you can make this vaccine without using live animals and grow it in cell, cell cultures, why not the others? Um, so initially everybody thought, why don't we try and import that one so we don't have to be using a vaccine that results in so much rabbit death, but that one is not eligible for import into the United States under any circumstance. Um, it has a live myxomatosis virus vaccine. And so that is not allowed to be used in the United States at this time. Um, it's restricted because of export prohibitions. It's restricted by MDS animal health. And because of um, the National Environmental P Policy Act, it doesn't allow that vaccine to be used in the United States. So the vaccine, when you hear about this controversy that's developed from cell cultures, is not allowed to be used. There is a push right now for the United States to manufacture a vaccine. This has been ongoing. There are some companies that show interest. There's a push for them to develop one that would be grown in cell culture and not require the use of live rabbits. Um, all of that may be many, many years away or may not happen. Unfortunately, the development of a vaccine for rabbits um, just doesn't have the I guess, push right now for it to be a top priority um, with concerns about distribution, sale, need, that type of thing. And especially because the disease is in the wild population, which would not get vaccinated, um, it creates some controversy. But there is an active push for some United States manufacturing company to please take on the development of a US licensed vaccine, which would then make it readily available maybe less expensive, remove all the restrictions on using it and maybe make it so that it does not have to be administered by a veterinarian. This is a chart from, the, from Europe, so it doesn't necessarily apply here because they're comparing vaccines. The Novavax Mixo RHD Plus, which was the one that was developed to cover for um, myxomatosis as well. And then if this is a comparison to the Aravac or Filavac, the two that we can import here, and the original Novavax Mixo RHD, which did not have RHDV2 because the disease wasn't recognized yet. And I'm not gonna really go through it, but it's basically just showing how to decide which vaccine is most appropriate. For the purposes of us here in the United States, our choices are only Iravac or Filavac. Both will cover for RHDV2, depending on which one your veterinarian or your state veterinarian authorizes import of. For RHDV2's behavior, um, so we've touched on a little bit of this a few times. This is basically um, discussion of the durability of the virus, which survives 105 days at 68 degrees or warmer, stable for three and a half months at room temperatures. This disease will survive freezing and it will survive thawing. It will survive um, almost a year at 39 degrees and it'll survive extreme heat for up to an hour. Again, just the nature of viruses and just the fact that viruses themselves tend to be really powerful and tend to be really able to um, withstand a lot of harsh environmental conditions so that they can go about wreaking their havoc. Seasonal outbreaks are starting to be recognized where reservoir and wild rabbits or feral domestic rabbits occurs seasonally. So we're seeing more of it having to do with potentially breeding seasons. We're seeing more of it having to do with, with movement of animals, changes in the environment. But remember, vaccination and biosecurity really remain our best defenses against this disease. 
Uh, here's an image of the Aravac vaccine, which is, can be one of the two that can be imported to the United States. This one is specific to RHDV2, the variant that we right now are most concerned about in the United States. Um, it's an annual vaccine. It does not require a booster. And in my personal experience, the rabbits have done really well. The vaccine reactions that we've seen in our hospital have been minimal to things like being a little bit off for a day or maybe not eating well for a day or so. We have not seen any deaths and we have not seen any severe vaccine reactions. One batch came and there was some sensitivity at the injection site. I don't know if something was a little bit different with the pH of them, but nothing that has resulted in anything serious yet going on almost a year of vaccinating rabbits that has made us concerned about continuing to vaccinate. And I think most people have had very similar experiences in vaccinating rabbits. Again, there's no known cure or no known treatment for this disease. A rabbit that is suspected to have disease that doesn't succumb requires intensive supportive care and isolation. If they receive the right care, they can remain hydration. It doesn't move on to complete hemorrhage. Some of those rabbits will survive, though it tends to be a very small number of them. It doesn't mean it's not something worth trying if we can provide proper supportive care and carry those rabbits through. Of course, there would be no diagnosis. It would just be a suspected case and we would be treating that. Of course, that leads into why many of us bring our rabbits or why rabbits come to the vet. It may be some of those symptoms that fit with this disease. And so the question is whether it's related or not and whether um, that is something that we would ever know. But if a very sick rabbit came in and succumbed and had any symptoms, we'd have to worry in a suspect state that it could be related. And there are no known effective antiviral drugs or any other treatments that exist for this. So the best thing is prevention. Another thing like today's event um, in the BunFest and other virtual conferences and Facebook pages and, and people's interest is the spread of information. One of the most critical things that we can do. One of the things that I'm very lucky to be able to be sharing this with you today Again, some of this may be review or second nature, and some of this may be new and interesting information, but informing veterinarians. I know of veterinarians that haven't heard of this. Um, animal shelters and rescues, pet stores, um, fellow rabbit lovers, anybody that you think should know about this should know. I can speak from personal experience. A lot of clients I meet that have pet rabbits you know, they have pet rabbits, but they're not like super into rabbits. They're not in rabbit Facebook groups. They may not follow the House Rabbit Society page, things like that. Haven't heard of this. And sometimes when I mention to them that we have the vaccine, they say, I don't even know what you're talking about. So um, education, awareness, and spreading information to anybody that you think needs to know is vitally important. So how to protect your rabbits, some general information, of course, practicing biosecurity, keeping rabbits indoors. Some people have adapted a no shoes in the house policy where they leave slippers or something like that. So they don't bring anything contaminated from the outdoors into their home. Some of these are more relevant to people who may be large scale breeders or producers um, who have large numbers of rabbits that they need to protect. Hygiene, washing hands, washing clothes, using appropriate disinfectants. Netting or insect control is important. Monitoring your other pets that could come in contact with rabbits and thus spread the disease. And most importantly, do not touch dead wild rabbits. If you find rabbits, especially if you find them with hemorrhage, of course we know that hemorrhage could be from trauma or other issues, but if you find dead rabbits, it's important to contact your state veterinarian, let them know. If you're in a current state that is known to have the disease, which we consider an endemic state, they may or may not do testing anymore. Part of the problem with that has been once we know it's in a wild population and once we know it's been and, and has killed pets, the state veterinarian may not need to do as much testing or may not do any further testing once we know it's there. Part of the problem with that is, is disease surveillance, but the other part of it is um, expenses and all of that that goes into it. So just because you report it doesn't mean they're definitely gonna wanna test for it. 
If you have not visited the House Rabbit Society's website, rabbit.org, when you open that page, the big disclaimer right at the front is all about RHDV. You'll see um, pictures like this, lots of information. A group of us that are, are comprising the RHDV2 task force, a number of veterinarians, um, rabbit knowledgeable rescuers, House Rabbit Society educators, people involved. Um, we have a task force. We've written protocols for care, for shelters. And there's a lot of information that the House Rabbit Society has put up there that's useful. And you can share this information or direct people to it and know that information is there. Essential steps to protect your rabbit. A closed rabbitry at this time, so no ins, no outs. Be careful about wild and feral rabbits and predators that could be around. Again, washing hands, disinfecting everything, controlling flies, um, not feeding contaminated food or outdoor um, grasses and plants if you're in an area where it's been seen. Being careful about keeping rabbits indoors, not sharing equipment with others, um, reporting your state veterinarian if there are dead rabbits observe, observed, especially die-offs in wild populations where a lot of them are seen. Not transporting rabbits in and out of quarantine areas or all those endemic states, and then quarantine any new rabbits, one of the most important things. So again, following these essential steps, some of them are common sense, some of them have been drilled in our head with our COVID pandemic. And some of them are just things that people sometimes don't think about and we need to be extra careful. Also, as I've mentioned a few times, other pets in the home, it's ideal and recommended to keep cats indoors. Again, that in itself tends to be a pretty controversial topic about feral cats and feral cat populations, but it might be safer to keep cats indoors. Leash walking dogs, making sure they don't come in contact with wild rabbits. Um, again, some people have gone so far as to get booties for their dogs or keeping disinfecting wipes. Um, just trying to take those extra precautions right now. Designate separate areas in your home if your dogs don't need to, to or your cats be around your pet rabbits, keep them separate as best as possible and maybe increase your barriers from say like an exercise pen or a baby gate to something a bit more solid just to try and control it. And then using your flea treatments or your, your biting insect treatments on um, rabbits, cats and dogs where appropriate and where necessary. And again, to some people, a lot of this sounds like it might be overkill. Again, it's just like we've dealt with with COVID to some people just wearing a mask was overkill. So again, you have to think through it. You have to plan what makes the most sense to you. You have to take the steps that you believe are gonna be able to protect your rabbits, protect the rabbit population and what makes sense so that we can practice proper biosecurity. Again, with environmental persistence, the virus is present in all excretions and secretions, including contaminated bedding, contaminated food might be a source of infection. And again, this virus can survive a long time outside of the host. Um, it can live on clothing, it can live on the bottom of shoes, it can live on car tires. Um, if you're in any of the Facebook groups, you see mention of some of these things that come up. There are fears of people who accidentally drive over a roadkill rabbit that may have died from the disease and then their car tires are contaminated. They drive in the garage. Again, I'm not saying those things to scare people. I'm saying those things to spread information and create a deeper level of all of our understanding so we can approach this more sensibly. As far as disinfection, the USDA has put out a document, the House Rabbit Society as well, on proper disinfection. Um, it's inactivated by several chemicals. Most commonly used is gonna be a diluted bleach solution or accelerated hydrogen peroxide products. Rescue is one of the more commonly used. This is one that we're currently using in our veterinary hospital for disinfection and cleaning. Um, we know it's effective that way. So um, consider proper disinfection, proper dil dilution when you use any of these disinfectants. Be really careful using any chemicals around yourself and your pets that you follow manufacturer's instructions and you make sure that things are diluted when they need to be. And then we're not using anything full strength because that could be dangerous and inappropriate. But proper disinfection is a key to slowing down or stopping disease spread. And don't forget about the wild rabbit population because I've mentioned it several times, but 
this disease is decimating wild rabbits. Um, in the past several years, thousands of rabbits have been killed because of this. The disease is thought to have began among domestic rabbits, but once it got into the wild rabbit population, it's really been catastrophic for the wild rabbits in all those endemic areas with huge die-offs. Um, this virus joins a list of emerging wildlife diseases that is currently basically devastating wildlife across America. Most people don't realize that we do have some threatened or endangered species of rabbits that live um, in the United States. And with small populations of them already, you can see the potential for a disease like this to create an extinction of some of the rabbits that we know are critically endangered. For those that do wildlife rehabilitation, again, be careful about rehabilitating wild rabbits. If you have or keep domestic rabbits of your own or you run a shelter or sanctuary or because you care for domestic rabbits, you extend that to caring for wild rabbits. Um, all of the reasons we've discussed. RHDB2 is, is resistant to some disinfectants. So remember, use the proper disinfectants, clean everything properly and make sure you're minimizing the spread. Do not allow people who have rabbits come in contact with wild rabbits and report any unusual mortalities. Again, your state veterinarian is the first source or your regional wildlife staff or even wildlife health units. Anybody that you wanna to report to should take this very seriously if you put in a call. If you do have to touch or manipulate a carcass, triple bag it, keep it in a cool place. If you think that they may wanna test it, again, invert the first bag around it so you don't have to touch it at all put it in another bag and then in another bag, make sure it's not just baking in the sun um, because the tissues will rot, but um, make sure that it's triple bagged and you contact your, your state or local veterinarian for advice on what to do. But again, wildlife rehabilitators need to know about this and need to be sensitive about their role in controlling the disease spread. For those in clubs and shows, again, largely the rabbit show circuit has closed, but I believe it's starting to reopen in some areas. Um, rabbits from states or counties that have it should not participate in the club shows right now. Rabbits should not participate in events if any rabbits in the home are sick. That should be a given regardless of this disease. It's ideal to check with state veterinarians to determine restrictions on rabbit movement. Um, and it, it club shows or hosts should strongly consider certificates of veterinary inspection for event participation requiring a health certificate in order to take your rabbit to shows. Again, rabbits that participate in these events should be placed in quarantine for 30 days afterward to observe for illness. And owners should determine whether they need a longer quarantine. So should the shows reopen while this disease continues to spread, people have to take those steps to make sure that they don't come in contact with it at a show and then bring it back home and potentially spread it after that. And just remember, it's illegal to move rabbits in any area if they're under a quarantine order. So if a state veterinarian issues a quarantine order and says rabbits cannot be moved in or out of that state, um, it is illegal to do so. And if you get caught, yes, you will get in trouble. So just pay attention to that. That rule is in effect for a very good reason. So in summary, RHDV2, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus strain two is a dangerous and insidious virus wreaking havoc currently in the United States. It continues to spread throughout the wild rabbit population and experts and epidemiologists are predicting it's just gonna continue its path and eventually make its way all the way through. Vaccination that we've discussed and biosecurity measures that we've discussed, information that's also available online, also available on numerous websites. Um, most notably the House Rabbit Society website has all this information are necessary for control and slowing the spread. Risks to endangered wild species. I have a picture here of the riparian um, rabbit that is a species that lives in California and is a critically endangered species, the riparian brush rabbit. Um, remember that when diseases like this spread through the ecosystem, they alter it. So there's far reaching effects of die offs. Um, one of the things to consider is that rabbits represent a food source for a lot of wild animals. Another thing to consider is that this just changes the, the normal flow of the ecosystem. 
and can cause more far-reaching changes when we see issues like this. Again, there's no risk to human health. I guess that's an important aspect of understanding it. And there's unfortunately no treatment for rabbits that become infected with a continued very high mortality rate of this disease. A few references for some information. It's also easy enough to do a, a search on Google, but if you wanna check specifically, um, rabbit.org and rhdv2.com seem to be staying both very current and both have a lot of links to other information as well. The USDA has some fact sheets. They have not updated those recently, but they still have good information on biosecurity as well as disinfectants. And then the shelter operating procedures document is available as well as a download from rabbit.org, the page of the House Rabbit Society. I would like to thank Ann Martin, who's another speaker in today's event for loaning me her RHDV PowerPoint of which this one was built from. And I used some of the information, so I appreciated her loaning that to me as well. And we can discuss any comments, questions, or any concerns. And as I mentioned earlier, any corrections that anybody feels may need to be made in what we've said here. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pelney. That was amazing. Really some good information. Um, I see a couple of questions in the chat. If you're willing, anybody who has a question, please uh, type it into chat. We'll be happy to take those. We still have a bit of time. Um, so the first question was about, you had mentioned not feeding wild gathered uh, grasses and things to our bunnies. What about things you grow in your own garden? Are those safe? Generally, they should be. I mean, the, the goal is not to feed wild gathered if you're in an endemic area or a known area where, where rabbits have died. Um, many people actually have resorted to growing their own as a means to feel a little bit safer. Um, almost jokingly, like how many times there were references to the COVID pandemic, all the people that learned to cook and bake bread mm -hmm. and all of those type of things during the last year of COVID, many people have taken to that. So if you take precautions, if you keep it protected, if you keep wild rabbits away from it, generally things you grow yourself are going to be fairly safe within reason. Concerns were for people who were buying, you know, sort of produce at the grocery store, finding out where it was coming from, where it was grown, and just paying attention to that. I don't think that's been a big source of spread. I'm not familiar with any definitive causes of that. But again, it was just another aspect of biosecurity. But directly answering, if you grow it yourself and you protect it and you're very careful, that's probably one of the safest ways to ensure that it's, it's not going to be a risk to your rabbits. And, and what about the concerns about the hay that we're buying for our bunnies and where, where that's grown? Yeah, there's been, um, that topic has come up quite a number of times. Um, Oxbow Animal Health, which most everybody's familiar with, um, the company that produces a lot of the, the products that we know and love, um, has had a lot of interactive Facebook discussions and has a lot of information on their website about that topic because they are a producer and they have addressed that as well. That does not seem to have been a problem either. Um, people have been really careful, hay production. Um, we're not seeing a definitive link to saying somebody ordered hay from Amazon and brought the virus into their home. But there is a lot of information about that if you follow it up with the um, pre-recorded lectures, discussions, and information that Oxbow has about the safety of imported hay and foods. Okay, great. Um, do you know specifically if the virus has been found in Northern California? I guess the question is how far Northern? I, I know California is currently considered an endemic state um, and it's been reported. I'd have to double check the latest reportings of specifics in each state. Like I mentioned earlier in the lecture, once it's been definitively seen enough times, the degree of testing often drops and it becomes less of an issue whether it's in every city and town and every location and more just that it's been identified in that particular state. 
So we'd have to check the, the latest or the newest reports to see if anybody has definitively reported it. We may see die-offs in certain areas and the state veterinarian says, well, we've seen enough of it in that state, we don't need to test in every area. So California in and of itself is considered an endemic state because it's been definitively seen in enough parts of it. I think you've answered this question, but it was asked, are other animals besides rabbits at risk? No, this is a specific virus for rabbits. Okay. Um, there's a question about whether these slides will be available on our the shelter website. So uh, we are recording this. If if I did it correctly, um, we will have it on the Bunfest website. Uh, hopefully, you know later today or tomorrow. And I have emailed you a copy of the lecture in PDF document. So I sent that to your email this morning, which you're welcome to to distribute as well if people wanted to print or save the PDF. Um, again, you're welcome to share that for people that want a copy of their own, or if you wanna just have it as a readable PDF you know, on your, on your site, that's fine, but you have it to do with what you think people would use it for. Oh, thank you for that, that that's great. Like you said, the more we can get this information out, certainly the better. Um, there's a question about, is it procedure to vaccinate all incoming rabbits in local rabbit rescues. And I will just say that in Sonoma County, I know that the shelters, at least the animal shelters, are vaccinating rabbits. Um, but what is your uh, information on rescues and other groups? It's different for different people in different locations. It has to do with the, the funding and the finances of some of the rescues. It has to do with the shelter's willingness and participation. Um, the, the vaccine, when it was imported, when, when we got permission here in Arizona to import the vaccine, our state veterinarian also gave us permission to distribute to other veterinarians so that 100 veterinarians didn't need to order it, only a few needed to, and then you can distribute and, and basically have them reimburse you for the cost of it so that it could be given to multiple veterinarians and use it. Um, I'm not sure shelters, as far as I know, haven't directly imported it themselves. And as far as I know, the shelters aren't routinely doing it, at least in Arizona, but it's something that's been considered and discussed. More often than not, the shelters have made a push to telling people, get a post-adoption exam. When you adopt a rabbit from us, get established with a veterinarian find um, somebody to do that immediate exam. And at that time, we're relying on the veterinarians then to educate them. So my understanding is shelters have not necessarily imported the vaccine to import all incoming rabbits. And rescues, it's largely been dependent on that rescue. Some of the rescues have vaccinated all of their rabbits. Um, some of the rescues, one I know here in Arizona is, is vaccinating all their rabbits before they can be adopted. So it's, it's an individual, choice option or depends on the, the local circumstances. Okay. Um, someone said, I keep seeing people on Facebook talk about they've rescued a stray rabbit in their neighborhood. Do you have any advice to the people who are just picking up these strays and may have their own pets at home? Practice all tenants of quarantine and biosecurity. Um, we certainly all do that, <laughs> you know, um, that's a, a curse some of us suffer under um, with continued rescue or those of us that foster rabbits and take others into our home. Do the best you can to quarantine and keep them separate. Don't share food bowls, don't reuse litter boxes, designate food, water, litter boxes, linens, that type of thing to those individuals and do everything you can to keep everything separate. Um, you know, and just not risk disease transmission. The second part of that, and I've had this question too, is obviously after a certain amount of time, you know the rabbit probably doesn't have the disease or is unlikely to have it if they've survived. So we know the incubation period and we know that um, there could be asymptomatic shedders, but in most cases, it's probably safe to say that if you pick up a stray rabbit, and it seems fine after a few weeks, it's probably not infected and it's probably gonna be okay. Um, certainly if it if it's, doesn't succumb to any illness and is okay after 
you know, several weeks or a month, it much less likely lowers the possibility of it. So it's, it, it remains safe to do that if you're careful, overly cautious, and don't risk the transmission. Some people have contacted me and said, we take in strays and fosters, but we treat them all as if they could be potentially shedders and they just manage it that way. And I think that's probably the smartest way to go with it. Great. Don't see any more questions. Just one huge big thank you, which uh, I share. This information is wonderful and helpful. Great. And yeah, we'll, we'll try to share it far and wide. We'll make links to this recording available in every way we can. Um, so that if you are part of a rescue group, perhaps you can share it as well so that we can just disseminate this information. So I, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. And we really, really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to share.